welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Lou Nguyen, a college student and co-founder of the Oberlin Policy Research Institute, an undergraduate public policy research organization at Oberlin College. My guest today is Sharon Yadin, Associate Professor of Law at the Paris Academic Center School of Law and a member of the Israel Press Council. We will discuss her article, Regulatory Shaming in Environmental Law, and her two successive articles on regulatory shaming, Saving Lives Through Shaming in the Harvard Business Law Review Online, and Shaming Big Pharma in the Yale Journal on Regulation Bulletin. Welcome, Professor Yadin. Hello, thanks for having me. It's nice to have you on. So let's start off with why did you write these articles and what's the major crux of them? Um, Well, I've always been interested in new innovative ways for the government to control corporate behavior in the markets. Then I noticed something interesting. I started noticing that regulators are now adopting new tactics that depend on negative publications, often made online and through social media. And these publications aim to shame companies into compliance and good behavior in general. I wanted to understand this instrument and see if it can be justified in terms of efficiency and in terms of balancing between corporate interests and the public interests. I also wanted to explore the legitimacy and the democratic aspects of these publications, such as enhancing public participation. Um, This project is especially important now, I think, because some agencies are rolling back past initiatives of regulatory shaming, while others uh, currently adopt these tactics. So it seems that we are possibly at a crossroads, and that is why I wanted to write uh, this article with a normative agenda and basically ask this question, um, is regulatory shaming something that regulatory agencies should do? So let's back a bit and go over what's regulation and what is shaming? Um, Well, regulation can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. But in this article, regulation refers to governmental activities that are intended to steer the market through laws, rules, and regulations and applying them to private entities. Um, It relates to authorized agencies that have legal powers to set standards, monitor compliance, and enforce laws and regulations. And the regulatees include corporations, businesses, industry sectors, and nonprofit organizations. Um, regulation, Regulation is usually aimed at the business and social activities of private markets and the supply of goods and services to the public, such as health, education, communications, retail, food, and electricity. Um, These are all adjusted and directed by government intervention. And that is the basic meaning of administrative regulation. Regarding um, regulatory shaming, um, well, that refers to the publication of negative information by administrative agencies about specific companies that provide commodities or services to the public in order to induce the public to act in some form that would convince the company and other companies to behave properly. Um, Public response can be considered effective and successful when it causes reputational damage to the company and motivates it to change its ways. The goal of regulatory shaming is to further the public interest. For instance, 
regulatory shaming agencies such as the Occupational Safety and Health Administration or OSHA send out condemning press releases and use social media like Twitter to publish the names of companies that are responsible for workplace safety violations. Um, the FDA publishes lists of companies that are possibly blocking competition in the pharmaceutical industry or infringing safety regulations. Um, generally, regulatory shaming can be used to enforce criminal norms, civil norms, administrative norms, and even corporate social responsibility norms, which are voluntary. Uh, the information on which regulatory shaming is based on uh, may be detailed, uh, it may be summarized, it can be presented in text, colors, or ratings. Um, it may contain direct condemning statements by the regulator, or it may be more subtle. Um, it is important to note that regulatory shaming aims to communicate a negative view of the shamed company or, or its activity. It invites relevant communities to apply pressure, to change the discourse, to alter behavioral patterns or ways of thinking about the shamed entity, and in appropriate circumstances to denounce, condemn, or, or boycott it. For example, um, for, for example, employees of a shamed company could demonstrate or strike. Um, shareholders might sell their holdings. Competing companies may embargo it from professional associations, joint ventures, or conferences. Other businesses could avoid entering into contracts with a shamed company. Politicians could refuse its endorsement and contributions and avoid aiding its cause or furthering its interests. Consumers may boycott a company's products or file a class action suit. The media may be hostile to a shamed company um, in its coverage of its activities in general and refuse to advertise it. Also, the residents of the area in which the company is located may demonstrate against it and disrupt its activities. Nonprofit organizations may file suits against the company, and governmental regulators may, may pay uh, special attention to its activities and concentrate enforcement resources on it. So this seems like a good point to talk about your first article, regulatory shaming. What's the major arguments in that piece? Well, um, the article's ma main argument is that shaming is a desired regulatory strategy from both normative and practical perspectives. First, regulatory shaming is inherently efficient. It can achieve regulatory goals in a quicker, simpler, and less expensive way than other enforcement tools. Second, it encourages citizens to play an active role in regulatory processes. It advances cooperation, democratic values, and trust between the government and its citizens. The advantage, that, the advantage I believe, is um, especially important in this era in which citizens' trust in the government, its bureaucratic and regulatory systems, and even the corporations themselves is declining, and regulatory shaming can help restore this trust. Third, I argue that regulatory shaming doesn't affect regulated corporations in the same manner that um, regular shaming affects individuals psychologically and emotionally. So it can be considered a soft and proportional tool for administrative regulators in comparison with other enforcement strategies such as criminal or other administrative uh, proceedings. Um, and in this article, I talk about um, the difference between civilian shaming and uh, 
governmental shaming, um, I should say that the word shaming is often used in the context of social media or other types of media um, to refer to situations where a person is exposed and condoned by other individuals for an inappropriate or illegal behavior, for example, for parking in a handicapped spot or for not helping an old lady cross the street. Um, but regulatory shaming is very different from civilian shaming. Um, regulatory shaming refers to situation in which shaming is undertaken as a governmental regulatory strategy by administrative agencies and not by a private person. And it aims to promote the public interest and not some private agenda. It also targets corporations and not individuals. So the critique of shaming being inhumane, cruel, and immoral is mostly relevant when it comes to corporations, which are, of course, artificial entities. Um, shaming in the context of individuals relates to causing them emotional discomfort, embarrassment, and a desire for the ground to swallow them whole. Uh, such descriptions are not consistent with the ways in which we usually perceive corporate personhood. Uh, regulatory shaming doesn't aim to humiliate or hurt individuals' feelings, but to inflict reputational harm on business organizations and nudge them in the right direction. Uh, also, unlike civilian shaming, regulatory shaming is subject to public law norms. So I think these are major differences between uh, civilian shaming and governmental shaming that affect the legitimacy of regulatory shaming. Uh, when you talk about norms, um, both within the legal and social context, can you expand on that a little bit? Um, sure. Um, I talked about this in my article, uh, Saving Lives Through Shaming, um, in which OSHA, uh, OSHA, which is responsible for safe and healthy working conditions for employees, uh, has been issuing, it has been issuing press releases about corporations that violate worker safety uh, regulations. And the agency published it on its website and on social media platforms. Um, and the, these press releases included statements with identification of a specific company, a detailed description of its workers' safety violation, um, violations, the implications for employees' health, and a moral judgment of the company's uh, behavior. For example, on one statement, the agency said that this employer is risking the safety of workers by failing to comply with fall, pro for fall protection requirements or this employer's failure to protect employees resulted in a tragedy that could have been prevented if training was provided and machinery was appropriately guarded. And even statements like Statements like the company's extensive list of violations reflect a workplace that doesn't prioritize worker safety and health. But in this article, um, I suggested that shaming is not only a suitable, but also essential, an essential tool in occupational health regulation that can supplement OSHA's hard regulatory tools. I, I then differentiated between two types of regulatory shaming and suggested that OSHA expand from the first to the second. I call the first type of shaming, um, which OSHA regularly exercises towards employers, compliance shaming. 
And the second type, beyond compliance shaming. Compliance shaming is essentially a part of the agency's command and control regulation. It refers to statements that are made about regulatory violations, inspection results, incidents, orders, citations, and so on. While beyond compliance shaming refers to standards that are not legally binding but can help prevent workplace accidents. Uh, so, using this typology, I suggested that OSHA would publish a list that ranks best and worst companies according to their incident rate, which would reflect all injuries and not only those that are a result of violations of safety regulations. I also suggested a ranking of companies according to the quantity and severity of workers' complaints and to perform surveys of employees' level of satisfaction with their employer safety programs. Um, the companies would have to reveal their score in their physical facilities or branches, on their products, on their websites, homepage, on their mobile apps, and uh, in their reports to the stock exchange, if, if that is relevant. So we've talked a lot about OSHA. Let's go on to the Food and Drug Administration, which you talk about in uh, Shaming Big Pharma. Can you go over what you suggest and what you wrote about in that article? Well, sure. Um, last year, the FDA uploaded a shaming list of more than 50 branded drug companies that allegedly tried, these are big, large companies, uh, the leading companies that uh, allegedly tried to block competition from generic drug companies. And according to the FDA, um, potential applicants for generic drug approval are being prevented from obtaining samples of certain branded products named in the list which are necessary for attain, attaining FDA approval of generic drugs. The FDA commissioner stated that he hopes that the publication of the list will discourage this type of bad behavior by branded drug companies. Um, and in my article, I try to break down regulatory shaming to the following uh, five components. Uh, the first component is choosing a topic for regulatory shaming that third parties or what I call shaming communities will be interested in or passionate about. The second is identifying the right shaming group, those people who can and will act in order to influence the company's behavior. The third, taking a regulatory moral stand that is non-controversial and that the shaming community can easily agree with. Uh, the fourth is properly shaping a shaming message that is well communicated and specifically designed for the chosen shaming group. And the fifth is disseminating the shaming message through suitable media channels. Um, so, in principle, the public can easily identify with the need to keep drugs affordable and can be expected to, I think, react strongly to branded companies' attempts to manipulate the market. It can affect investors, employees, and even patients and induce them to take action. However, I found that the FDA's shaming list was extremely uncommunicative in its language, which included a lot of pharma jargon. Um, also, the data was not well organized or presented, and it was very complicated to read and understand. It was also not distributed through appropriate channels for effective impact. These findings suggest that 
the agency has not fully considered the shaming process its relevant participants, and its intended results and effects. Uh, the, F the FDA publication obscured its main message and failed, in my opinion, to realize the full potential of regulatory shaming of the pharma industry. So in my article, I suggested that the message would be simple and direct, Instead of lengthy text embedded with pharma jargon or undecipherable charts and data, I think the FDA should use short statements, infographics, easily digestible numbers, scores, and ratings, and intuitive and attractive design. I also suggested to report to the public on how FDA shaming efforts have helped change pharma companies' behavior in order to encourage further public participation in regulatory shaming processes. So let's expand a little bit on this idea of public participation in the shaming process. Uh, first of all, on how it's communicated, uh, you pray in your article shaming Big Pharma, you praised uh, OSHA and the Department of Health and Human Services for providing uh, communicable and very readable graphics and information. Uh, how does that help a community hold the, these groups that, are, that regulators are trying to shame accountable? Well, I think um, the way that the message is articulated and presented to the public it has a major factor in this and a regulator that will follow, I think, what I've suggested in my uh, project um, will, will make it a much more informed a decision regarding the way the message should be displayed. Um, if you want to, if you want to address the general public, then perhaps social media is the tool for you. Perhaps press releases, and the message then should be really simple and concise. Maybe use maybe use some sort of scores. Uh, maybe use uh, numbers, um, colors. Uh, sometimes regulators use emojis, uh, something that the public can relate easily relate to. And um, when you um, want to um, address other communities uh, like uh, creditors and the industry, um, professional unions, uh, um, communities that are more professional then maybe choose um, something that can be uh, more sophisticated, maybe use data and uh, explanatory text that is more uh, lengthy, and, uh, and, and, and you might consider uh, other modes of uh, dissemination, uh, not necessarily um, social media and... Uh, uh, maybe maybe consider other forms of uh, communication, perhaps in conferences or uh, using new professional newsletters. So I think the message uh, really should be um, uh, displayed and disseminated um, if, uh, while thinking about the the proper uh, the relevant audience of the message. So there's a critical distinction here between uh, shaming, which you detail in your article, and uh, disclosure rules. Can you go on about what these particular differences between these two topics are? Well, sure. Um, Sometimes shaming is central to the regulatory act, while in other cases, shaming is merely a byproduct of a regulatory action that focuses on informing, 
educating, warning, or facilitating transparency. Um, sure, these are all forms of regulatory communications, but they have different characteristics and different goals. Disclosure regulation requires manufacturers and service providers to reveal information about their products. For example, manufacturers in food and drug industries have to provide certain information on their packaging. The objective of disclosure regulation is to provide consumers with the necessary information to make an informed decision about purchasing a particular product or service. And disclosure, re disclosure regulation comprises two main components, making information accessible and supporting decision-making. The idea is to help consumers to decide whether, how, when, where, and how much to use a product or service. Regulatory shaming, however, works in a different way. Shaming involves a negative judgment and the expression of normative disapproval by the regulatory agency. The message may express dissatisfaction, scolding, or condemnation, and it will highlight the shamed entity's unacceptable behavior character, set of value, values, or beliefs. Under the regulatory shaming method, the regulator aims to induce a reaction and even action from relevant communities towards the shamed company. For example, um, after receiving the shaming message, consumers may feel negatively toward the company and may even boycott it. But in general, regulatory shaming can target various stakeholders and it is not focused mostly on consumers. By contrast, the informational messages conveyed by disclosure regulation are non judgmental in nature. So while consumers may decide not to buy a specific product based on information that was mandatorily disclosed, they they don't necessarily feel negatively towards the manufacturer and they are not expected to boycott it, protest, or file suit. For example, regulators can mandate food manufacturers to disclose the amounts of sugar in their products. This is still disclosure regulation, but if a regulator decides to publish a list that rates companies according to the levels of sugar in their products and even states that these companies do not make enough effort to improve the health of their customers, then this could be regarded as regulatory shaming. But eventually a lot of examples will be in a gray area because regulators often try to achieve multiple goals through publications that are actually a mix of both shaming and disclosure. So the quick question I think is the level of condemnation that is inherent in the regulatory act and which characteristics are dominant in the regulatory act. So for regulators, what would the advantage to using regulatory shaming be? Well, um, I think that first we have to understand that modern regulators lack efficient enforcement tools and constantly seek new and effective ways to regulate. The main tools of enforcement available to regulators today are either criminal or administrative, for example, fines, civil penalties, citations, orders, and licenses license revocations. However, both criminal and administrative sanctions, sanctioning require great regulatory resources, take a lot of time, and are not always effective. For example, many regulators do not have the manpower to routinely inspect every facility in the country, and they can afford costly criminal trials. 
of course, the fact that corporations cannot be incarcerated means that monetary sanctions remain the most commonly used corporate enforcement tool, but the sums imposed are often low and don't induce change in corporate behavior. So consequently, the regulatory enforcement world is very much engaged in the search for new, more efficient, and more effective methods to increase corporate compliance. Shaming is cheap. Um, it involves communication, conveying information, beliefs, and ideas, um, press releases, and online publication such as on regulatory agencies' website or social media, are virtually costless. In some cases, it's the corporations themselves that finance the cost of such communications. Also, a model called enforcement pyramid tells us that regulatory regimes that lack diversity in sanctions encourage violations while regulatory regimes that have a variety of sanctions and enforcement methods encourage compliance. So regulators that adopt regulatory shaming, even in principle, not ever having to actually use it or they can use it infrequently, could improve compliance. Furthermore, research shows that corporations are threatened and motivated not only by the risk of classic legal penalties, but also by informal social and economic sanctions stemming from negative publicity. Um, adverse publicity has both a general and specific deterrent effect on firms. Uh, for example, uh, research shows that OSHA's adverse publications improved compliance with safety regulations by dozens of percent. Another point is that regulatory shaming is best based on civilians and not on coercive governmental powers. Although the regulatory agency creates the conditions for shaming and initiates the shaming process, it does it with what uh, we call a light touch rather than being involved in the markets directly. So these characteristics enhance the legitimacy of the regulatory process. It can also increase the participation of the public in governmental and regulatory processes in a way that increases trust between government and the public. Um, shaming tactics can also strengthen the agency's legitimacy in the eyes of industry, which tends to be confrontational and highly resistant to regulatory policies, as most of the enforcement in the regulatory shaming process comes from stakeholders outside of government. And what are the negatives for regulators on regulatory shaming? Well, I think over deterrence is the real concern with regulatory shaming. Um, shaming may cause firms to become bankrupt or financially unstable. This is a particular worry because regulatory shaming may spin up out of control especially in the internet age, in terms of uh, scope and magnitude. And therefore, regulators must consider appropriate forms of shaming, its timing, its objects, appropriate cases, and the relevant shaming communities. Uh, my article lists the criteria that regulators should consider before applying shaming tactics. Um, and we should also remember that regulatory shaming aims to fulfill a public interest goal. And so it may be justified even at a certain cost to corporate reputations. Another point to consider is that regulatory shaming may indirectly affect company officers. 
prominent shareholders and other stakeholders on a personal level. My answer to that is that individuals who wish to operate through corporations and provide commodities or services to citizens take into account the cost of governmental regulation. They must expect a certain cost of doing business. And some of those costs are related to reputational injuries, not only of the corporation, but also of prominent shareholders and company officers. Uh, but of course, regulators should always try strive to apply the least injurious tool that can effectively achieve the regulatory goal. So as a final question, what would you like uh, the public, uh, uh, legal practitioners and regulators to take away from your articles? What's the main things that uh, they should be concerned about? Um, I think uh, corporate reputation, the message is that corporate reputation is very important to companies today. And accordingly, regulators should, should build on that and concentrate efforts on social media and other online platforms to harness public opinion. Um, I think companies make great efforts to maintain their reputations in the community and establish their standing. They want to show not only that they act within the boundaries of law, but also that they are socially responsible. So the main message of this project is that the shaming of corporations by administrative agencies can be justified from economic, democratic, and liberal perspectives and should therefore be considered by regulators in varied types of regulatory settings. Um, but of course, regulatory agencies must impose the sanction of shaming reasonably and proportionately. They must evaluate whether this tool can achieve uh, the regulatory objectives and they must wait against other enforcement strategies. Uh, regulators also need to ensure that shaming information is presented fairly and accurately and must avoid any appearance of abuse of discretion. And I hope courts and uh, the industry, um, shaming communities and the public in general will also take uh, part and support this a very important tool, in my opinion. All right. Well, thank you for coming on to the podcast to talk about your excellent articles, Professor Yagen. Well, thank you so much for having me. curious or confused, get information or a pamphlet at most pharmacies or a health clinic. If you need help, see a doctor.